steps to life is opening God's Word with you. Welcome to the Steps to Life Camp Meeting 2002. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until He will refuse to acknowledge them as His children. Stay tuned for revival and reformation messages. Dear people, Lord, may be able to go and finish this marvelous work that you have given to each one of us. Father, I pray this morning that you will be with a speaker in a special way, Margaret Davis. I pray that you will bestow a double portion of your Holy Spirit upon her as she speaks to your people this morning. And Father, help each one of us. Open up our ears so that we may be able to hear your still small voice. And lead us, O oh Lord, into the direction that you will create a character that will reveal your son Jesus. We thank you for his marvelous an awesome sacrifice that he paid on the cross of Calvary. And, O oh Lord, I pray that you will prepare each one of us for heaven. So bring a special blessing upon each one that's here this morning. It is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Once again, I give the platform to Sister Margaret Davis. We often speak of the latter rain, but unless you have received the showers of blessing under the early rain, you will never receive the latter rain. And the message that I am bringing you is the preparation for the early rain. It is the gospel that opens the heart and then you can receive the Holy Spirit and have the early rain experience. Then, as you grow under the early rain, you can be prepared for the latter rain. My husband has a book. It's called Coming, the Latter Rain. Are you ready? Are you sure? It's in the bookstall back there uh, by John Davis's books. So we are not related, but we are good friends. <clears throat> uh, we want uh, people to realize what the preparation is for the latter rain. The latter rain falls into no vessel that is not clean. And that has not grown under the early rain. <clears throat> I want to continue with the steps here. We were on step number four. Believe what Jesus can do when you surrender to him. I want to read another statement on... Um, I think I'll read that one I read right at the close again. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. We may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and that means your addictions too, and fall at his feet in penitence. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love, to bind up our wounds, to cleanse us from all impurity. Here is where thousands fail. They do not believe that Jesus pardons them personally, individually. They do not take God at his word. 
How soon was the leper cleansed when he believed? Immediately. And we are given that example of cleansing from sin. Restoring the heart. We read in Review and Herald, that was from Steps to Christ, 52. I'll go on. It is the privilege of all who comply with the conditions to know for themselves that pardon is freely extended for every sin. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength, purity, and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. He is waiting to strip them of their garments stained and polluted with sin and to put upon them the white robes of righteousness. He bids them live and not die. But the Israelites didn't believe many of them and they died. And they died in their sins. And God did not prevent it. Because we have free choice. He does not compel us. He tells us what to do. But he does not force. Through all ages. This is Review and Herald. August 1, 1893. Through all ages. And in every nation. Those that believe that Jesus can and will save them personally from sin. What do they believe? That he can save them personally from sin. Not in sin. From sin. Are the elect and chosen of God. These only are the elect and chosen of God. Those who don't believe it, what can Jesus do? They obey his will and come out of the world and separate themselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice. It is a sad fact that the great proportion of God's professed people have not had faith in Christ as their personal Savior. How many? The great proportion. Yesterday we read the great proportion were lukewarm. Why? They have not had faith in Christ as their personal Savior. They don't reach out and surrender to a God who can change them. Because they have been taught it takes years to get victory over sin. It takes years to get rid of your addictions. It takes years. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And so they don't even start the work of a lifetime. Because they don't come to the foot of the cross where cleansing and restoration takes place. And at that moment, you can have eternal life. But if you stay on living, you rise to walk with all the power of heaven available to you. Through the Holy Spirit, through spiritual food, and through the incense, which is Christ working in you. To produce prayers and good works that are acceptable to God. Desire of Ages 173. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart. You see, people just give half of the heart. This sin or this sin or this sin. Just like, and, and the Spirit of Prophecy says there are many who try to reform by giving up this sin or this sin. 
but they never surrender the self. But when the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden the burden of sin, the burden of guilt. Or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to Christ. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. It is God's work. That's his part. He will cleanse. He will forgive. He will regenerate. If we will only surrender and believe what he can do. We read that it takes as much power to arouse those who are spiritually dead and to create new tastes new motives as to raise a person from the dead. That's how much power it takes to do a new creation of your heart and your mind. But God can do it. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. He who through faith is righteous shall live. The gospel is to be presented not as a lifeless theory but as a living force to change the life. God desires that the receivers of his grace shall be witnesses to its power. I'm on page 39 for those who are trying to follow. <clears throat> we read in John 1.12, and Ellen White quotes it in Christ's Object Lessons 314. I'm in the middle of the page. As many as received him, to them gave he what? Power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This power is not in the human agent. He doesn't say, here is the power, now live by it. No. Where is the power? It's in Christ. It's in Christ. And you have that power only as long as you abide in Christ. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God. When a soul receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. And so only as you allow Christ in you continually do you have the power to live the righteous life. It's a continual walk with God. It's continually abiding in the vine. So you can have the fruit of the Spirit, which is the character of Christ. <clears throat> Christ connects fallen man in his weakness and helplessness with the source of infinite Power. What kind of power? Infinite power. All power that is available. When the sinner accepts Christ and lives in him, Jesus takes his sins and weaknesses and then grafts the repentant soul into himself so that he sustains the relation to Christ that the branch does to the vine. We have nothing we are nothing unless we receive 
virtue from Jesus Christ. And so it's continually depending on his power working in us to produce whatever fruit is necessary for living the Christian life. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I used to think the fruit was how many branch Sabbath schools I was running in the Philippines. You see? And people think the fruit is how many Bible studies they are giving. How much good work they're doing for others. No. The fruit is living the character of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit. That is how you test yourself. Because you could be doing all kinds of good work and not have the fruit of the Spirit in your life in your home, with your family. There is no other way for man's salvation. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Through Christ and Christ alone, the springs of life can vitalize man's nature, transform his tastes, and set his affections flowing toward heaven. One Selected Messages, 341. He is the source of power implanted within us. And his influence will flow forth in words and actions. Gospel religion is Christ in the life, not knocking at the door. And many people today make fun of the Christ in you principle because the new theology teaches Christ is up there in heaven he lived a perfect life and he's got that perfect life put to your account and all you have to do is believe it brothers and sisters if he is not living here your hope is in vain Christ in the life is the hope of glory it's what the Bible says and I know, one of those leaders told me, oh, you think you're a little Christ. No. No, I'm totally dependent on Christ. You can never have the power of Christ on your own. You only have it as you abide. Christ abiding in the soul exerts a transforming power and the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reign within. We drink in the love of Christ as the branch draws nourishment from the vine. If we are grafted in Christ, if fiber by fiber we have been united with the living vine, we shall give evidence of the fact by bearing rich clusters of living fruit. How do you help others become Christians? By living his life and then sharing what God can do in the life. It's a living testimony. What is the loud cry at the end of time? A living testimony. Here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Ellen White says that is the loud cry. A living testimony. What God can do in the life. Inward grace will be revealed in the outward actions. What is the inward grace? Who produces it? Christ in you. Righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. 
<clears throat> so here is righteousness on the outside testifying that there is righteousness on the inside. Righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. The first is our title to heaven, the second is our fitness for heaven. So Christ in you is your title to heaven. What comes out is the fitness for heaven. That's what it says in Messages to Young People 35. Righteousness within and righteousness without. The first is justification, your title to heaven, imputed righteousness. It says his grace and power he imputes to all who receive him by faith. And it becomes the living principle within you. What is the living principle within you? The imputed righteousness, which is your justifying righteousness. And then your sanctifying righteousness is what comes out because you are connected with the vine and the living principle works in you. The power of God producing the fruit of the Spirit. That's found in Messages to Young People 35 and 6 Bible Commentary 1098. By receiving his imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit we become like him. And so you see the fruit of the Spirit shows that we are becoming like him. But how is that happening? Through the imputed righteousness. The living principle in the life. <clears throat> and so Jesus says in John 15, 4 and 5, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Abide in me. Another one, the middle of the page, 42. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. How much of the fruit? Whenever you need it, ask, and it will be done unto you. If you need patience, Lord, I'm here. I need patience at this moment with my children. Yes, child, and he works in you patience. That's how it works. Any time you need the fruit of the Spirit, ask and it shall be given to you. But you must be fully committed. Christ must be abiding in your soul. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you prove that you're a disciple? By their fruits. By living the fruit of the Spirit in your home and everywhere. When <clears throat> this is taken from um, Desire of Ages 676, when we live by faith on the Son of God the fruits of the Spirit will be seen in our life. Not one will be missing. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in Him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. And then the question is asked in Review and Herald 12, 21, 1886. Are you in a position where you do not possess these graces? 
Just as soon as anyone crosses you or offends you, does there arise in your heart a feeling of bitterness, a spirit of rebellion? If this is the spirit you have, bear in mind you have not the spirit of Christ. Is that plain? It's very simple, it's very plain. Even a child can understand that. If a child has a wrong attitude, it doesn't come from the Spirit of Christ. It comes from the other spirit. Let me read a number of quotes that will help you to see this because this is very important for us to understand. Because too long we have allowed a wrong spirit in the home and everywhere and we have still thought we were in Christ as long as we were trying not to have a wrong spirit. But yet people can carry bitterness for years. They can carry resentment for years. Children can be rebellious for years and have a wrong attitude toward parents. But as long as they go to church, we think they're still in Christ. No. Christ does not produce those things. He is not the minister of sin. He is a minister of righteousness. He only produces righteousness in the heart. Never sin. If sin is in, it's another spirit. You cannot serve two masters. By their fruits ye shall know them. 2 Corinthians 13.5, very important text. 2 Corinthians 13.5, I'd like you to look at it. 2 Corinthians 13.5. I am on, I don't have the page here where I'm on. I've taken this from the back somewhere of the book because I won't be able to cover that part. <clears throat> but I want to throw this in here. Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? And so God is testing us. Are you abiding or are you not? Here is the question, <clears throat> Review and Herald, July 12, 1887. But you will say, how am I to know that Christ is in my heart? If when you are criticized or corrected in your way and things do not go just as you think they ought to go, if then you let your passion arise instead of bearing the correction and being patient and kind, Christ is not abiding in your heart. It's very plain. Very straight. The Spirit of Christ will be revealed in all who are born of God. Strife and contention cannot arise among those who are controlled by His Spirit. Strife and contention cannot arise among those who are controlled by his spirit. Five Testimonies 2.27 And the Bible says in 1 John 4.13 Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And how do you know whether you have his spirit? By the fruit of the spirit. By the fruit of the spirit. If anger is coming out it's a wrong spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. 
Self-control is a better word than temperance. Temperance we think of not smoking and drinking. Self-control is control of passion and everything else. Appetite, whatever. When we give way to impatience, is that easy to do? Oh, it's the easiest sin to commit. When we give way to impatience, we drive the Spirit of God out of the heart and give place to the attributes of Satan. It's very strong, I know. But I have to say it because it's truth. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. Jesus and Satan cannot abide in the heart at the same time. It's an impossibility. That was taken from two selected messages, 236. And this is messages to young people, 114. When, <clears throat> to whom you yield yourself, this is quoting from Romans 6:16. 6, Ellen White said, if you had only this one text, it would be enough. To whom you yield yourself, servants to obey. His servants you are, to whom you obey. And if you let anger come in, who's, who's ma which master are you obeying? The other master, you see. To whom you yield yourself. Here comes a temptation to get angry. And you yield. You are yielding to the other master. To whom you yield yourself, servants to obey. His servants you are, to whom you obey. And she goes on to explain it. If we indulge anger, lust, covetousness, hatred, selfishness, or any other sin, we become servants of sin. No man can serve two masters. If we serve sin, we cannot serve Christ. Think of it this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. If I get angry with this lady, where is love? Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Gentleness. Meekness. Faithfulness to represent Christ. Self-control. Where is it? It's not there. You cannot serve two masters if you test yourself by the fruit of the Spirit. If you test yourself by how many Bible studies you give, yes, you can serve two masters. But God didn't say test yourself by how much good work you do. He said test yourself whether you have Christ in you. And how do you know? By the fruit of the Spirit. No man can serve two masters. If we serve sin, we cannot serve Christ. That was messages to young people, 114, and Mount of Blessing, 93. Christ does not say that man will not or shall not serve two masters, but that he cannot. He cannot. It's an utter impossibility. We cannot be fretful and impatient and still be Christians. For a fretful, impatient spirit is not the spirit of Christ. You see? That's how you tell whether Christ is in you. Test yourself. Impatience brings the enemy of God and man into your family and drives out the angels of God. If you are abiding in Christ and Christ in you, you cannot speak angry words. You cannot. 
For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ephesians 5, 9. You cannot indulge your temper and have your own way and still remain the children of God. We shall have to struggle with our hereditary weaknesses or tendencies. But Jesus struggled with those too. That we may not yield to temptation and become angry under provocation. You see, this is why I say you cannot blame anyone else for your sins of the heart. Satan takes the control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Let no one deceive his soul in this matter. <clears throat> Pride and selfishness can find no place in the character without crowding out him who is meek and lowly of heart. As soon as you allow pride in, you crowd out Jesus. He cannot abide with Satan. Pride comes from Satan. Look at 1 John 1, 5 through 7. 1 John really helps us to see this plainly. Very bluntly, he says it. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is how much darkness? No darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness, we do what? We lie. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, does what? Cleanses us from how much? All sin. And then Ellen White asks the question that I might know him, 185. What is lying against the truth? It is claiming to believe the truth while the spirit, the words, the deportment represent not Christ but Satan. That's what it means to lie against the truth. To surmise evil. Is it easy to surmise evil? To misjudge someone? To judge their motives? Oh yes, we need to be very careful. We have no right to judge motives or thoughts. And even a word. And you think, hmm, that was a little strong. He must be impatient or angry. Be careful. A strong word might be needed. That doesn't mean the person is impatient or angry. So be careful not to judge motives. Evil surmising. To surmise evil, to be impatient and unforgiving, is lying against the truth. But love, patience, and long forbearance are in accordance with the principles of truth. Truth is ever pure, ever kind, breathing a heavenly fragrance unmingled with selfishness. Selfishness can no more live in the heart that is exercising faith in Christ than light and darkness can exist together. But there again we have to be careful how we judge others. Because to you another's action may look selfish. To him it may not be selfish. Do you see? We grow in grace and understanding how to live the love of God. When Jesus was five years old, would God have asked him to go to the cross? 
No, why? In his growth in grace, he would not have understood that love would demand such a thing. He had to grow in the knowledge of God until he could understand that the love of God would demand his life. And you and I are growing in grace if we're in Christ. And we grow in living his love. We grow in all of these fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> but at every stage of development our life can be perfect. You see, as Christ was. At every stage of development, his life was perfect. Yet he had a lifetime of sanctification. Sanctification is living in Christ. Living the fruit of holiness. Growing in grace. And throughout eternity, you will grow in grace. Won't you? Deeper and deeper understanding of the love of God. This is talking about the disciples. When they came to the upper room, what was happening in their lives? They were arguing and bickering, separated from Christ. They knew they were sinning. They knew because they put a distance between them and Christ. They didn't want him to hear their selfish words. And it says... Desire of Ages 650, while pride, variance, and strife for the supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. They were not abiding. They hadn't yet learned how to abide. As long as Christ was very close to them, they were activated by his love, like a little child to a mother. And this is why parents are in the place of God to their children because as the parent is living God's love that child is taking part of that because it doesn't yet understand how to relate to God but as that child is taking part of the mother's love the Holy Spirit can produce love in the child because the mother is praying for the child and the child is under grace only that way are your children under grace you know, some people think children are saved until the age of accountability. When is the age of accountability? Oh, maybe 12, they say. And so as long as they're not 12, they can sin and do all kinds of things and they're under grace? No. It says, if the baby in your arms, if you allow that baby to have a temper tantrum, Satan is in control of your child. Children are the lawful prey of the enemy unless parents put them under grace. There is a great work for parents to do by example and by teaching and by living and by praying to keep their children under grace even as babes. I have a whole section on that in the book. <coughs> We cannot be fretful and impatient and still be Christians. For a fretful, impatient spirit is not the spirit of Christ. Okay, the Bible says in James 3, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You see, you are not abiding if you have those things in your life. Look at uh, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. <clears throat> While you're looking that up, I'll quote a couple from 1 John. If you say you love God, what's the rest of it? And you hate your brother, you're a liar. You see? You're a liar. If hate is in your heart toward anyone, and yet you say you love God. You're a liar. You cannot have hate in the heart and have Christ in the heart. It is not possible. If you say you know God and you disobey his commandments, 
What are you? You're a liar. Very straight. Very plain. Very direct. That's the text we're going to read right now. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. And then again, Ellen White asks the question, Review and Herald, March 29, 1892. Oh, you may say, I do keep the commandments. Do you? Do you carry out the principles of God's commandments in your home, in your family? Do you never manifest rudeness, unkindness, and impoliteness in the family circle? If you do manifest unkindness at your home, no matter how high your profession, you are breaking God's commandments. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is patient and kind. You see? No matter how much you preach the commandments to others, if you fail to manifest the love of Christ in your home life, you are a transgressor of the law. And so you see, we can look at others who are deliberately breaking the commandments and we think we are better than they. Be careful. And be very considerate of others. They may not know. Maybe someone has never taught them how to abide. I can remember when I was studying. <clears throat> First of all, I, I studied to get to know what is righteousness by faith. And then when I realized what it was, and when I went to share with my family, and they said, you've got to share this in our church. And I started sharing in churches. And then people said, but we want the notes. Uh, can you make us a book with this in? And then I realized I needed to put it in a book. And so I, I decided before I put anything into print, I must study it in such detail that I'm not going to misuse it. And so I, I took myself um, time. <coughs> um, I decided I would read everything in context first. So in two years I read all the spirit of prophecy that was available. I think we had 66 books. All the Review and Herald articles, all the science articles, all the Review and Herald books. And um, I mean all the spirit of prophecy books. And I marked everything that I could find that had to do with the plan of salvation. And as soon as I would finish reading a book, a friend of mine would take it and type out all the statements I had marked. And so we went through the whole 66 books. Then I did the same with the Bible, 66 books also, and marked everything. And then I took all those many pieces of paper with all those statements and I categorized them according to justification, sanctification, sin and forgiveness and the vine and the branch and abiding and all of these things. And then I studied them line upon line, precept upon precept. Everything I had found in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy on that topic. That took me ten years. And then I pulled it together. And the first book that I pulled together had 1,400 pages. I couldn't leave out anything. It was all so precious, so wonderful. I can remember 
the day I was studying the vine and the branch. <clears throat> there were so many quotes on that, and Ellen White said it is the most important picture Jesus gave of his connection with his people, the vine and the branch. And as I spread them out on the table, comparing statement with statement until there would be no variance in my mind, there were too many. I spread them on the floor and I knelt there for days studying the vine and the branch. And when it clicked, when I realized what it was saying to me, I just could hardly believe it. This is God's connection with his people. And you see, the vine out there cannot close the little valve to stop receiving the sap, but you and I can. You and I can. Any time we can stop the Holy Spirit from working in us. We have freedom of will. We don't have to let him work. We can choose whom we will obey. But if the Holy Spirit prompts, yes, Lord, I'm here. We need to respond. Then as soon as I had these 1,400 pages ready, I typed them all, and I'm not a typist. <clears throat> I printed them. I printed 5,000 of those. My husband said, where are you going to get the money? I said, I don't know. That, God didn't tell me that I was responsible for that. I was just responsible for pulling it together to help people understand. And the very week I was ready, I kept on working, no money. And the very week I was ready to put it to print, someone donated $20,000 to print it. I still don't know where it came from, but God provided. And so I knew God would provide. And then I, um, I knew immediately it was too much. And so I pulled it all apart and made it smaller. That took a while too. I, I finished with three booklets. Experience the gospel, experience the three angels' messages, experience uh, the uh, sanctuary message. And in the sanctuary message I also had the home. Still it was too much because now people wanted to translate it. And so it was too much. So then I took it all apart again and pulled out the most important statements, leaving out so many wonderful statements, and put it into this little book. And then I sent this little book, the one that you have there, I sent it to every um, mission, Adventist mission station in the world, to the Ministerial Association. And I said, if you want this book for your ministers, please let me know. I will send it free. Now, I had my name and address in the book. I didn't know what would happen. Had I known, I might not have done that. But anyway, I started getting letters. Send us 70, send us 50, send us 30, send us 20 for their English-speaking pastors. Oh, by the way, the three volumes, the three booklets, I sent to English-speaking pastors, 8,000 of them. But this one I just sent to the mission stations, and then I let them choose if they wanted any. And. Um, Especially from Africa. Uh, the, the pastors there started to use the books. They used them in camp meetings, they used them in different places, and pretty soon the people caught on that here is something they needed to know. 
and they got hold of the address and lay people started to write me and so I get thousands of letters from Africa I mean thousands whenever I get home from a trip there's a box of letters waiting pleading for books and and they say your book makes it so plain the way of salvation and there is so many wonderful statements there can you also send me the spirit of prophecy and so they plead for the spirit of prophecy well then I send them the the conflict of the ages sets and I get letters from all denominations Catholic priests nuns have become Adventists because of this book um, uh, a whole Jehovah's Witness Church became Adventist because of this book the pastor shared it with his people and I get letters from Pentecostals from Baptists from Muslims the Muslims say they accept this book even though they won't read anything else and I just keep praising the Lord and the Lord keeps providing the funds to keep sending them out and so if it has been a blessing to you then share it with others I have no idea I didn't keep count and I don't know how many spirit of prophecy books I've sent either I have it all on my computer but I have never had time to count it and uh, it's now uh, printed in 12 languages and um, I haven't done it people just realize this is important they start translating it this year the German language will be finished uh, Hungarian uh, the uh, Romanian language is being worked on Spanish language was finished three years ago and so it goes and it's in Korean and Russian in Ukrainian in uh, uh, Chinese in um, Swedish and Danish and Norwegian different languages a language in India a language in Kenya but Africa has sent me the most requests they don't have many books over there and so to receive a free book is wonderful to them I also send out those three big spirit of prophecy sets and if anyone wants to help with those there's a great need out there for the ministers to receive the spirit of prophecy my time is up again uh, this, this next meeting we will go into the next steps when temptation comes what do I do how do I keep from falling back very very important session so please stay by let's have prayer Heavenly Father thank you for alerting us before it is too late help us to really take hold of the salvation that you have to offer salvation from sin and not in sin oh father let not one soul be discouraged here today but help them to look to you and to know that there is power to keep them from falling to cleanse to regenerate and to walk with you thank you father for your plan of salvation in Jesus name amen <laughs>